Entrepreneur. Judges, don't leave, by the way, and don't get too drunk, because you do have to bake it off. Um, we have a legendary entrepreneur here. Find that founder showcase welcome. Big, warm round of applause for Elon. There's a lot of first-time entrepreneurs in the crowd, so advice you would give them. Like like Jason did earlier, but you gotta one-up him. Uh, really tell the truth and like give people, you know, the absolute pitfalls here, which I know you'll do because you got me in trouble last time I interviewed you for tipping to us. So first of all, I want to talk about risk because I'm of the belief, and I've written about this wide wildly, I think entrepreneurs we love what <laughs> I think entrepreneurs have um, are really taking less risk in Silicon Valley than they were 10 years ago. And I think you're interesting because, you know, your other PayPal co-founders were considered really risky for getting back into the web as early as they were. Um, you know, whether it was LinkedIn, whether it was funding Facebook, whether it was Slide, a lot of these are, they were really the pioneers in believing in the web again, which was considered crazy at the time. But you were considered crazier. I mean, you got <laughs> done with PayPal, and you went right. and started a solar company, a rocket company, and an electric car company. Right. Like it would be hard to come up with a crazier combination, and yet you've had a quicker IPO than those guys. You have how many billions of dollars you're getting from NASA from SpaceX? Um, well, we're uh, about two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, who's the crazy one now? I mean, you and, and, and exactly. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you told me before that, like, I asked you for a crazy in an interview before, and you said, well, yeah. look, if I, <laughs> if, I, if I were thinking that this is the best rank order investment, I would not have done these, because it would have been crazy. Yeah, so, like, absolutely. What exactly. method did you take? You know, tell us about how you come up with an idea. Um, well, um, at Adeo, you know, we were, we were ha um, housemates in, in college, uh, and uh, that, that would have been actually one of, really, our first venture together was running a, kind of a nightclub-ish situation. Really? Yeah. Is nightclub a euphemism? Uh, <laughs> no, it's really a nightclub. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we, we had the site. Well, um, that, that's how we first met. We were actually just uh, uh, transfer students to UPenn and um, staying in, in like this the storm, storm situation, which was uh, not, not a lot of fun. And uh, and so uh, we're just talking in the cafeteria and like well, we really want to get out of this dorm situation. So then we were able to find a house that was this huge house that hadn't been rented, and there, there uh, so it was like a ten bedroom house, mm -hmm. and um, there were just two of us. And then we met to get this like this freshman to join us in, in the house. It changed his life forever, I, I think. Um, <laughs> freshman. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, hell. Um, yeah, he, he took a different path after after that year. Um, <laughs> Can you tell us the most outrageous thing that happened in this nightclub? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, I, I, what's the amendment you plead at the fifth? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but I did have my mom there one night, um, and <laughs> just like came to visit. It's like, um, by the way, we're holding a kind of a party at night, and. Uh, anyway, that, that was that was that was a lot of fun. Um, Adeo kind of took care of the the entertainment and uh, the decoration in the house. It was sort of like like a New York nightclub, basically. What was your role? Um, I was kind of the the sober one. Um, <laughs> you were the sane one? <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> wow, it's all relative, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, so. Uh, right. So back to taking risks. Yeah. So that 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 was actually quite risky, by the way. If we've, we've been bust, we would have been in deep trouble, but. Um, but so let's see. So, so in college, I, um, I, I was trying to think of you know what are the three areas that would most affect the future of humanity, at, at least you know in my opinion. And the, the three areas that I that I could come up with were uh, the internet, um, so the uh, transition to sustainable energy, both production and consumption, uh, and space exploration, um, uh, but particularly making like multiplanetary. Um, so it, was, it wasn't from the perspective of those were the things that I would expect to be involved in, but rather those were the things that I thought in the absolute would most affect the future of humanity. So uh, those were the things that if, if I had the opportunity, I would like to get involved in. Um, and uh, my initial thought was, was that I was to actually do something um, in electric vehicles. And 
Uh, so I, I actually came out of Silicon Valley, spent a couple summers at a place called Pinnacle Research, which uh, developed the uh, high energy density ultra capacitors. Um, but they're, they're super expensive. So the I, I said I was going to come to to Stanford uh, and do um, a PhD in applied physics and material science, and just kind of try to figure out if there was a way to to um, mass produce uh, super capacitors or ultra capacitors um, at um, you know low enough price uh, and high enough energy density for them to be uh, a energy storage solution for electric vehicles. And that's what actually what what originally brought me out here. Um, and uh, that was in, in 95. And so I, I was trying to figure out, uh, you know, would this work or wouldn't it work? And this is one of those problems where you're not entirely sure whether success is one of the possible outcomes. Right. Well, um, and that's one thing that <laughs> VCs don't want to fund that's really changed in Silicon Valley. There's this um, uh, stigma associated with, like, so-called science fair projects. Right. So, so like, a, an, a, an, energy, an, an ultra capacitor with that of low enough cost and high enough energy density to compete with, with batteries um, um, is that's one of those things where the, 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 the you, you could spend several years and then the conclusion would be this is not possible. Right. Um, and uh, so I, I thought, okay, well that's that that but that was the path that I was involved in. Uh, you know, you at least add something to the tree of knowledge. You add a few more notes to the tree of knowledge. Um, and then um, and that's a, but that summer I was kind of just experimenting with some internet software and um, and. I thought, well, you know, I think the internet is going to be something that really fundamentally changes the world. It just seemed like the world was acquiring a nervous system. You know, that, like previously uh, we were like this uh, multicellular creature, but without a nervous system. And now we we are we have acquired nervous system. You could be in, you know, the, the jungles of Africa or I have been in the country. right. I've been <laughs> I'm from Africa actually. <laughs> I'm just from a small village in country. Africa. <laughs> Great. Um, but would you see the World Cup? No, I'm the biggest loser. I went just before the World Cup to speak okay. at a conference and then left, unfortunately. Where, did you go back to the World Cup? Uh, no, I was thinking Tesla IPO. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so, I mean, do you think that people are taking it first? Do you see people coming out of school and, like, I mean, there's a lot of people who have said that America's lost its fascination with science. I mean, we don't have kids anymore growing up and wanting to be an astronaut. We don't have kids, you know, in getting chemical sets for Christmas. I mean, you obviously were one of those kids who was very yeah, I think science. There's slight liability issues or something like that. <laughs> um, um, well, yeah, like, so my father was an engineer, um, and so I grew up in an engineering situation, electrical mechanical engineering, and, um, but I think if, if that hadn't been the situation, then I would have had a little exposure to it, even in South Africa, you know, so I think, um, the, uh, you know, one, one of the uh, things maybe that uh, engineers should have more kids. Um, <laughs> whether it's no nature or nurture, they're more likely to become engineers. Um, and uh, uh, you're you're doing that. You have like yeah, I'm, kids, I'm right? uh, doing my civic duty. I've got to make up for lost ground with some others. Um, <laughs> okay, so th this is all. This whole event is put on by the funded. So let's talk about funding. You've uh, started several companies, several companies in very wildly different spaces. Yeah. Um, you've done quite well yourself. Uh, from what I, unless the numbers have changed, last I heard, you I think put either it was 180 million between Tesla and SpaceX of your own money. But, uh, yeah. Um. And and so a solar city. Yeah. But, right. but really. Um, um, but it's sort of around 100 million for SpaceX. That's a about lot. About 70 million for, for skin Tesla. Yeah. Um, that, so that was all the skin I had. <laughs> really? Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all the skin you had, meaning you were eating ramen noodles, or meaning you also had a million dollar house. Like, how do you quantify that? Like, uh, it, it was it was all the uh, basically. I, uh, it, all liquid assets um, mm -hmm. were, were sold. Um, uh, I, I don't own. I actually, don't even own my house. Uh, so, oh. uh, yeah. And actually, to, as as was publicized, uh, I had to borrow some money from friends last late last year uh, to uh, you know fund fund living expenses. So let's talk about this whole idea of like having that degree of skin in the game. I mean, there's a lot of people who make a lot of money and invest in their friends' companies and become angels. I mean, you didn't you didn't go that route. Um, there's also a lot of people who just want to keep that money and want to raise a lot of venture capital. I mean, you had crazy ideas, but you also had already had a success. You probably could have raised venture capital. Why put that much of your own money? Was it out of need? Was no one going to fund a rocket company? 
Um, yeah, well, the, um, the, the sort of surprise yeah. thing came really uh, in sort of 2007 when it was clear that Tesla was in, in, a, in a very difficult position and would need to recapitalize the, the company, um, essentially double fund the company. Um, um, so uh, just to, to, to sort of, it was either that or, or let Tesla die. And why was so Tesla in that position? Uh, that is a long answer. Um, <laughs> um, just uh, the uh, that there have been a number of mistakes made by by the management team there uh, that uh, just uh, were very expensive mistakes, um, and and a lot of them, and and we, and uh, they've not been brought to light until um, kind of the really the thirteenth hour. Um, so uh, we, we had sort of scaled up uh, production inventory. So we spent a lot of capital on production inventory. Um, but there were a lot of parts that had been ordered that were wrong, that didn't work, that were out of spec, that just didn't, you know, just problematic. So uh, we, had to, we had huge write-offs on, on inventory. Um, and we had to redesign a whole bunch of parts and, um, uh, and, and resource, change, change suppliers in a number of cases. Did so you do a recap? Yeah, we had to, it, it wasn't actually, uh, well, it was, it was sort of kind of a, a bridge loan. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't a cram down round or anything like that. Right. So and how close were you to dying? Uh, well, it, it would, yeah, so the, the, that, that was the fundamental issue. E either I took, either I, would, I, um, I had a choice of either taking um, all my reserve capital and applying it to Tesla, um, basically all, all, all free capital, or Tesla would die. So those are the two choices. It, and, it, Finding funding um, for investors when the company is is was in the state it was in that was it was just there was no chance um, we would not survive any diligence process. <laughs> um, so across your companies, um, on a scale of of one to five, would have been your experiences with venture capital. One being. I guess we'll go with the voting <laughs> tonight. One being the worst and five being the best. I mean, people, you know, VCs get a lot of shit, but they are to some degree the lifeblood of this industry. I mean, where do you fall on that? Have you had good experiences or mostly bad experiences? Um, I think my probably medium. Um, George Zachary said you can't give threes. <laughs> uh, well, I think it varies considerably. Um, Based on on which French capitalist uh, is is doing the deal, it's, um, I think it, that probably varies maybe as wide as wildly as, as the entre individual entrepreneurs. Um, I think there are um, some some good venture capitalists, uh, and and them and but most are not. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you know, there's there's some. I mean, you know, d just like um, there there are some only only a few companies ultimately succeed. I think, the same is probably true of the venture capitalists. But aren't there more <laughs> successful venture capitalists who aren't very nice to startups than there are not very good entrepreneurs who succeed? There's a lot of both. Um, I, I, I'm not sure who would win the numbers contest there. Um, I, I, I do think uh, there's, um, I mean, there's, you know, there's been I think, uh, a lot of bad behavior by venture capitalists and you know, probably a lot of bad behavior by, by entrepreneurs. Uh, so um, I, I think my experiences were, were actually pretty good, um, you know, with uh, uh, M MDV and, and then with Sequoia. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So can we oh, and, and, and BFJ, I think BF, BFJ is, <laughs> I mean, I, my experience with, with BFJ has been very good as well. And Founders Fund, yeah. So I'd say actually, yeah, prob now that I think about it, actually probably uh, if, if, if I give, my experience is a four out of if, if five is the best rating. What's one of the toughest lessons that you learned that might be applicable to this audience in terms of raising outside money? I mean, what are the big pitfalls you don't want to fall into, whether it's angel or venture capital? Well, I, th I think um, it, it's better to take a lower valuation from uh, venture capitalists that, that you really like and get along with and mm -hmm. feel that like you're sort of on the same wavelength. It's better to take a lower valuation from that person uh, than, than a higher valuation from, from someone who you think you may not get along with. Um, so, yeah.
Um, and so that sounds like it's more about the individual partner versus the firm. I mean, there's a lot of entrepreneurs who come to Silicon yeah. Valley and are dying to get an investment from Sequoia, you know, not necessarily an investment from Roll-Up or from Mike or, you know, I think, I think both. Much more. I think both both matter. Uh, you know, both both the individual partner uh, and and the firm. I think probably the partner matters slightly more than the firm, but they they both matter because that partner could leave that firm and then you suddenly find yourself with a new board member um, that you didn't, didn't anticipate. That that actually that happened to me in one one case that I I won't talk about. But, um, that that was uh, the 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 lead partner of that firm. Sucks beyond belief. Um, <laughs> you're gonna say that, and you're not gonna tell us who it is. Um, sure, if people could guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> so obviously, a lot of your success, particularly with so Tesla. None of the names I've mentioned, by the way. <laughs> In case you're wondering. All right, so it's not Sequoia. <laughs> it's not DFJ. It's not. I'm trying to remember who else you mentioned. Uh, Refresh the ones. It's not. It's not founders, but <laughs> not just no, I, um, you know, I, I, I think very highly of uh, DFJ and Founders Fund, and uh, um, obviously Sequoia's reputation is, is great, um, uh, and, and MDB is fine. So, so none of the names I mentioned um, are, are <laughs> what I'm referring to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do a Google search. Right now. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, uh, what do you think about um, the way venture capital has changed in the time you've been out here? I mean, a lot of money flo has flowed into the asset class. The bus notwithstanding, more money was flowing into the asset class. Um, the returns of, you know, once 99 and 2000 fall off will be at or below the S&P 500, which has never happened in the industry before. Is this industry viable? Do you think it's broken? Do you think there's just too much money it needs to get out? Um, hmm. Well, I, I do think that uh, probably uh, there should be uh, a broader scope of investments that venture capitalists consider in Silicon Valley. You know, I think there's there's a little too much of people kind of focusing on on IT or focusing on Silicon because that's kind of the stuff that's gone before. Um, I, I think that there needs to be kind of a broader, uh, you know, look, a look at, at multiple different industries and uh, and then I think there's there's probably not, there's not not too much capital. I think there's probably too much capital chasing the obvious stuff. Mm -hmm. So, how would how do you think we're doing on clean tech? There was a lot of hype um, several years ago that clean tech would be the next big wave of Silicon Valley. If you look at it as we started with semiconductors that went to computers, went to software, and price software, and sort of everything spiraled up to the web, there a lot of people argue that's kind of the logical conclusion of that wave, and we need a new wave. A lot of people wanted that to be clean tech. Um, during the presidential debates, mm -hmm. Barack Obama said clean tech is our, the new PC for America in terms of creating companies and creating jobs. But you know, there's a lot of people who feel that that basic investment of science is sort of not being done. The stuff that was done in the early days of the internet, that in the computer, that drove a lot of that. Do you think that we're all talk when it comes to clean tech, or do you think that you know people are taking risk and really building that foundation? Um, oh, well, I do think that clean tech is is the, the kind of the new wave, um, and, uh, and 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 the, the the potential of value creation there I think is probably greater than, than on the internet. Um, just if you think of if you just look at the size of the economy that uh, energy uh, constitutes, uh, it's it's huge, um, way 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 bigger than, than the internet. Um, so um, you know the and, and we are you know. It's, 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 Sort of almost tautological that we're going to need to, to we're going to have to move to sustainable pr production and consumption of energy. Um, if it's unsustainable, it's you know <laughs> sooner or later, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I do think there's there's uh, there's actually a, a lot of opportunity there, and, um, and and we will see a lot of value creation in, in the clean tech space. Um, you know, it, t Tesla's done pretty well. Um, you know, I think, I think uh, one of the, I'm not sure how we rank it, but I think it's, we're one of the, the better IPOs this year. But I mean, uh, that's sort of, the question is, when it comes to people who want to invest in clean tech, like, who's willing to write the check? I mean, you had to put a lot of your own money into Tesla. Yeah. So does that mean only wealthy entrepreneurs start clean <laughs> companies? I mean, do you think there's the willingness 
to work for people to write the big checks to really develop the space. I mean, Tesla was not a web company where you can invest fifty thousand dollars and get a product out. Uh, no, but you know, if you look at something like PayPal, people might assume that hey, PayPal was not not a high capital endeavor, um, but. Uh, we spent about the same, actually maybe more, on, on PayPal before going public uh, than we've, we've, we've done on Tesla. Mm -hmm. So t PayPal was like maybe 250, 300 million dollars that, that of investment before going public. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it wasn't a small change. Um, and um, it, it is a little harder to, to get it like a demonstration article when you're talking about physical hardware uh, than, than if, you took it, if it's a website and you can do sort of a quick demo where and whatnot, but um, but I think in terms of capital, I think that there is, uh, I think there's actually sort of a misapprehension about the capital needs of of an internet startup versus, uh, say, a, a car company or a solar company or something like that. And in fact, the, the, the most ca the most capital efficient company uh, so far, and w which will be my and is actually my highest uh, return on investment is Solar City. By far. We never hear about Solar City. Tell us about it. How much did you put in? How much is it doing? What is? And that's a bold statement of the three. Um, yeah. Well, it's just it's just factually true. It's, it's not it's not the largest it's it's not the largest return in absolute dollars, but it's the largest return on investment. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, yeah. I think it's a, it's this point ten ten x worth ten x what my original investment was in my portion of the company. Actually, maybe more than that. Maybe twelve x. Wow. Um, and that's in the course of three or three years, four years. Like that, yeah. Not bad. Four years, then. yeah. <laughs> um, and it's yeah, it's not like the economy is uh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's that that that's I think a, a great a great company. Um, and uh, uh, well, it should be clear in the case of of, of Solar City, I, I don't consider myself a co-founder of, of of Solar City. Okay. Um, well, I, I did actually. Suggest the the idea to uh, Lyndon and Peter Wright that this is an area that um, that, 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 that they should pursue um, once they're done with their their other company, um, but I didn't put enough I'd say perspiration into uh, Solar City uh, to really warrant the co-founder status. Okay, I have two quick questions, and then I think maybe we're going to open up to the audience. We'll yeah. Okay, so just real quick. So, you know, I'm interested because I think there's a lot of founders in this room, there's a lot of people with good ideas, and there's this issue in Silicon Valley of whether or not you can be a founder but have to stay the CEO. Um, a lot of people like Sequoia, who you mentioned, tend to bring in a lot of other people to be CEOs. Founders Fund was started with the idea of, no, you know, in, in statistically the people who build the biggest companies are when the founder stays involved the whole way. Um, you know, you kind of step away from Tesla, came back, you, right. you I think, are you still the CEO of, of both SpaceX <laughs> yeah, and Tesla? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what is your view on this? Does the founder need to stay the CEO? Well, I think, I think what Founders Fund says is true. I mean, if you look at, say, um, Apple or Oracle um, or, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft before Gates left, uh, you know, it's it's true. I think that you know the, the biggest companies, most successful companies, are the ones run by by their founders or, or one of the founders. Wait, I have one more question. I have one more question. Oh, oh you're funny no, for the I founders, not because you were too glad I'm glad I'm done. Okay, so I, the, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, the last time I interviewed Elon, I asked him a question and. He called someone a douchebag, and I laughed because I thought it was funny. <laughs> and I got written up in New York media as like a horrible person for laughing that someone was called a douchebag. So, <laughs> I was like, don't I, you watch the Daily I Show? Know, <laughs> I don't want to get into your personal issues at all, but I just want to give you this forum if there's anyone else you'd like to call a douchebag. <laughs> um, I did get a little carried away in that interview. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> Yeah, New York Times did, did print a correction, um, but and, you know the no thing with corrections uh, on that the article the, the the guy that was a douchebag because he I mean you know <laughs> was um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and and, and they, they, they did uh, uh, they did print a correction to to the the, the, the douchebag the article he wrote, um, but uh, and nobody reads corrections so so and it was the fundamental premise premise of the article. It wasn't yeah, I mean, it was that just was incredibly was misleading. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, I should have said it was irresponsible and misleading and, and intentionally so. 
Er ergo, he's a douchebag. Right. So I was actually <laughs> asking, apologizing for calling him a douchebag. I was asking if there's anyone else you want to call a douchebag. Um. Let's see how long it's been meeting train since we last met. <laughs> it's actually not a long, it's, uh, it's a fairly short list. Um, I, I, I think, uh, I, I don't think I, I don't think it would be wise for me to, to, to call someone a douchebag. Um, it, that would just be repetitive. Um, <laughs> um, there's, I mean, there was recently an article in the New York Times uh, that was, uh, the, the same editor who, who, who wrote the attack piece on you, uh, he did, did basically a bank shot with, with his buddy in the New York Post. Uh, they did that on me last time. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's yeah, the guy. The, yeah. the guy who did the bank shot on you in the New York Post, uh, that, that the Sunday Times business editor, um, you know, sort of wrote a payback article, uh, well, had a, had a sort of payback article written on me a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. in the New York Times, which uh, obviously that, that was uh, not a great thing. To do. Um. <laughs> so, first, round of applause. Yeah. 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 Ah, all right, we got to do three. I'm getting like beaten up over time, but people seem to be enjoying. I was transfixed. So, three questions. Answer honestly. Whoa, there's a lot of hands. So, all the questions. What do we have you on here? These people have come in. Let them ask all, all right, two and a half questions. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. We have time now? Well, all right. What's your, what's your next, what are you doing next? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I, I'm definitely uh, uh, focused on SpaceX and Tesla um, and, uh, and, and don't intend to start any companies for, for a while. Uh, uh, I, need, I need to get a few things done with, with SpaceX and Tesla. Um, it, at some point, um, I, I have a design in mind for an electric supersonic vertical tech when I make plane. Uh, and I know. I know. I, that would be like, you know, um, I, I don't think there's been that much innovation in, in an airplane. Not at all. Um, As someone who just traveled the emerging world before yeah, we I'll tell you, not at all. I mean, like Especially the, coach. Right, exactly. I mean, like <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got like the 777 and the 787, and, and it's. Um, you know, the, these things are very, very incremental. Like they were like 10, 15 percent better than, than the last version. Um, so I think it would just be worth trying to do something that's uh, several generations beyond the current state of the art. Um, and um, I, it's not in mind. I'm very confident it would work. It's just a question of like the, the, the um, what sort of range can you achieve, and um, and how difficult would it be to achieve the, the level of reliability that people have come to expect in aviation? Those are really the tough parts. It's not what we're expecting to work. Um, um, yeah, that's, uh, uh, there's that, uh, and, and I have this idea for um, using uh, aerospace construction techniques, you know, so basically it's the, the high strength, uh, low, low weight, uh, 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 design techniques used in the space industry to create prefabricated uh, metal sections of a double-decker highway system. So you can sort of drop them in place with minimal uh, effect on the, the existing traffic pattern. Mm -hmm. um, Is that going to be affordable for emerging markets? Um, I mean, like, you can't even yeah. get through an intersection. It took me seven hours to get to a medium Mumbai, and less than 5% of India has cars. I mean, this is a massive need. Yeah, I, I do think uh, this, this actually would be... Um, Yes, so the, the, this this would probably have the bigger, you know, one of the biggest impacts if if, if you can if this can be done right. Um, I, I'm not sure how well it would work in emerging markets. It, it kind of depends on sort of like materials cost versus labor trade off. I, I'm confident it would work in, uh, you know, in like in the U.S. or in Europe or something like that, where labor is is kind of expensive and and the cost of, of Traffic delays of like you know adding a lane to a highway and having that temporarily reduce the, the amount of traffic that's incredibly expensive. Um, so I'm confident with that, that that it would work uh, economically in, in the U.S. Um, and it might work it might work in emerging markets maybe for like the, you know certain big, big cities. Yeah, exactly. E Elon's factory, by the way, in uh, Los Angeles is incredible. All right, shoot.
My name is Casey Leon with Pop TV. I have a question. Um, you have a SpaceX. Have you thought about evolving it into space tourism, similar to Virgin Galactica? Um, well, we, 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 uh, with, with SpaceX, we um, do intend to carry uh, astronauts to, to the space station, essentially take over the crew transport role of the, of the space shuttle. Um, and this big battle that's been fought recently in, in Congress over this as to whether it's going to be kind of a government-run system or whether it makes sense to outsource uh, astronaut transport. It appears uh, that uh, the, the commercial route is, is winning. Um, and so if, if we're carrying NASA astronauts, I think we certainly also want to carry uh, private, a private astronauts. Um, and, um, and then ultimately, the long-term goal for SpaceX is to try to um, uh, move us in the direction of becoming a multi-planet species and staying lucky on Earth. That, that's sort of the, so obviously that involves a lot of carrying people on car, you know, cargo. <laughs> You can stay CEO of both. What? Because you're going to pick, right? At some point. You can't stay CEO of both SpaceX and Tesla. You can do whatever he wants. That's, that's your rule. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, no, I've. Like, you said last time you I heard can't you talk, do you this. said this is not sustainable to do both. I, I think, I, think I, I agree it is, it is very difficult uh, to sustain in the long term. Um, the workload is uh, beyond the fun point. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and I, you know, I'm not sure that somebody should be CEO of a company forever either, you know, so um, I think at, at some point in the future, not in the near term, but at some point in the future, um, I'll, I'll have to probably just be running one company. This is, so this is your first public experience uh, in uh, Silicon Valley speaking, right, since you went public with Tesla? Yeah. That's awesome. All right, let's take a few more questions. All right. um, AJ Thomas with uh, Semantic Seed and the Gen Y Blogger. I wanted to ask you, do you really plan on retiring on Mars? <laughs> um, well, I can't say it's like I'm certain that I will retire on Mars, because uh, that, that requires a lot of things have to happen between here and there. Um, uh, I, I think it's just, I think it would be cool to do that. Uh, <laughs> 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 but I, that so that's, that is not predictive, it is, it is just saying that like, you know, cool. yeah, asp aspirationally, if, if best of all possible situations, then yeah, it would be great to ultimately retire on Mars. Uh, so Mars 1.0 like will be very people. utopian though, let's be <laughs> honest. It's not going to be filled with a bunch of day laborers who are like, what do I do? It's going to be like the great minds of humanity. It, it kind of it kind of would be sort of, uh, it, I mean, I think of necessity, it would be somewhat of an engineer colony, um, just because you've got to pull a lot of stuff and design a lot of stuff. So. Hi, my name is Uday. Um, I'm the founder of Live on Campus. Um, Elon, I wanted to ask you. We hear a lot about uh, the personalities of a, of a founder or a CEO, and both you, um, both you and Jason are obviously been very successful, uh, but slightly different personalities, I'd say. Uh, I'm curious. Have you? Uh, do you feel? I mean, did you? Were you always this way, as being more low key, or did you sort of mellow into kind of personality you have now? Uh, well, you know, Dave could probably answer that better than I could. <laughs> yeah, that's a question for Dave. Pew is the biggest dork I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually de dorkified by a hundredfold between over 20 years. You're, you're much cooler. I, I mean, I remember <laughs> like, when it's actually enjoyable to hang out with him, but back then it was kind of painful. And you'd be like, <laughs> he literally was the straight man, didn't drink. I'd always be like, Elon, I think the police are here. Can you go deal with it? Like, sure, I'm fine. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. I didn't drink in college, actually. I mean, not not from out. Not from. I it wasn't. I just didn't like this alcohol, really. I and mean, then it's a flavor yeah. issue, right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Your work is just impressive. Uh, sincerely impressive. Um, part of one of the catalysts, I think, with being an entrepreneur is is trying to do things that motivate you and things that you love. The money always comes second, usually. Um, so how, how much has focusing on humanity actually improved your own personal happiness? Mm. Um, you have been successful there, so. And yeah. with some ideas that were 
pretty uh, far out. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, well, definitely my, my personal happiness took a took a big dive when uh, you know around 2007, um, uh, when when you know te when Tesla's difficult situation became apparent, um, and uh, I had to substantially increase my time allocation. Uh, that 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 was tough, uh, and uh, in 2008 it was worse, and 2009 was even worse. Um, uh, and then 2000, but 2010 has <laughs> been much, much better. It didn't go off. It didn't go off like cars coming out and people loving the cars and like solved a lot of those problems. It really was worse in 2008 and worse in 2009? Um, it, it, well, okay, so probably the lowest point was. Uh, Late 2008, when um, the Tesla financing round uh, fell apart because the economy went into a tailspin, uh, the third SpaceX rocket launch failed, and I was getting divorced. Um, Triple whammy. Yeah, that sucked. <laughs> that really sucked. Uh, and then, fortunately, the fourth launch worked, and oh, so for SpaceX and. Um, we were able to close a financing, kind of an internal financing round, uh, in, in basically, yeah, like late Christmas Eve on in 2008. Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Merry Christmas to Tesla. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, Elon, maybe just uh, touch base on the significance of the recent launch, and that it made the first time the success of that, and what that really means to our country and and the space program. Uh, sure. So, so. Um, Falcon 1 is our small rocket. That's the one that succeeded on its fourth launch. Um, and uh, I, I'm certainly partly to blame there because I was the chief designer of the rocket, so. Um, uh, hey, wait, wait, wait. Hey, the, I don't think people understand this about it, all right? So, no, 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 no. Like, this is crazy. Like, he's the chief designer of the rocket. And one of the lead engineers in the car, on top of the CEO. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That's what happens to dorks in college. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, so, uh, with Falcon 9, unfortunately, we. Um, we, we succeeded on the first flight and we were able to get to orbit. Um, and Falcon 9 is is what uh, NASA has chosen to replace the cargo transport function of the space shuttle. So space shuttle retires uh, early next year, um, and uh, and Falcon 9 uh, will be what to replace it for cargo transport. That's that's a given. And then it's looking increasingly likely that it will replace the space shuttle as far as uh, crew transport but, but as well. Let me help. Key um, phrase the question better. How, like, give give perspective. Like, how long did it take to develop a comparable payload rocket, and how much money? And how long did it take for you to develop the nine, and how much money? Just put like orders of magnitude. Um, well, if you were to compare, it, say, the, uh, the the Falcon Nine to the the Ares One uh, vehicle, um, uh, and there's actually two parts to it. There's there's Falcon Nine and our Dragon spacecraft. Um, and then there's Ares One and the Orion spacecraft. Uh, so so far, uh, ten billion has been spent on Ares One Orion, um, and it carries fewer people to the space station than Falcon Nine and Dragon. Um, between Falcon One, Falcon Nine, and Dragon, uh, we've spent about half a billion. Uh, now there will be more spent between now and then uh, because. You know, going through more test flights, but we probably but they will spend more too. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> true. Uh, this, this, so the, the estimated cost for completing Ares One Orion would be another twenty to thirty billion. Um, for us, it would be probably to, to demonstrate crew and get through all that. It maybe it's another billion or five five hundred billion, something like that. So we're somewhere in the uh, in the maybe five percent of the cost. Is that comparable to Tesla? With electric car versus what was spent on the EV1, I mean, it, what is the delta? Is it similar? Um, yeah. Um, 
So just in, in, in R&D cost on the, the Tesla Roadster, we spent, yeah, about uh, maybe 150 million thereabouts. Um, and uh, the EV1, I think they spent over a billion. Um, so it's maybe, maybe not as significant a ratio, but it's still, still very significant. Um, and you know, the, the, the value of any company is uh, the, the free cash flow that it generates versus the capital required to generate that free cash flow. Um, that's really what defines the market cap of, a comp of, of any company in any industry. Um, so, um, you know, so if, if you want to build a valuable company, that's what you're going to do. You're going to figure out how do you make capital uh, generate a lot of uh, free cash flow. Uh, Robert Clegg, uh, founder of Noverse, We're creating educational video games. Uh, you, s you discover more life going underwater, more species we have no idea about, you know, on uh, on a cost savings of hundreds of times. Um, any disasters in the relatively near future are not going to send our civilization into space. We're probably going to go underwater. To what ex why aren't we exploring more underwater for cures, science, all these undiscovered species and new life forms in your, in your estimation? Why aren't we going underwater with NASA instead of out in the nowhere? Um. Well, I, I think that that's, that's not quite uh, the, the right, you know, the, if, if something were to happen that, that, that destroyed civilization on, on the surface of the Earth, I, I don't think that retreating underwater is, is really a you know, viable uh, option. <laughs> um, it, and it, it's difficult to say, what, 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 what is that thing? You know, it, uh, civilization is not going to last forever, forever, so if you... You know, at some point in the future, something bad will happen, or maybe some set of bad things will happen. Probably not. There's probably a series of, of, of things that would happen that would destroy civilization. Um, uh, and you know, I just, I don't, I, I'm, I don't think uh, there's enough separation. Like, let's say we had underwater colonies or something. I don't think you'd really have enough separation between land, what's going on, on land, what's going on underwater, to to really you not know, have the what what affects one affect the other. Um, but if you have different planets that are separated by hundreds of millions of miles, then even if something really terrible happened on Earth, I think you'd probably be okay on the other planet, um, and life as we know would continue to exist. Um, yeah, so that, that's that's my theory on that. So one, we got to get back to uh, the, the the business of uh, awarding a winner <laughs> and the cheesy trophy. Is one last fun? We got probably most of the house is entrepreneurs. Uh, judges, if you want to get ready, because we're going to speed through this, one parting thought for them, inspiration, comment, anything? Um, hmm. Well, um, actually, I, I, I kind of like a, a quote from a friend of mine, Bully, uh, about starting companies, which is, it's like uh, eating glass and staring into the abyss of death. Um, <laughs> But, but occasionally, um, that's not appealing. <laughs> <laughs> Start a company. <laughs> well, let's hope we pick a winner. Eating glass and staring at the business set. We're going to hang on a little bit for drinks, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so come, judges up. We're going to do this quick. We're going to pick a winner. So this is very important. I want the two finalists up on stage. We saw you ran over. Do you want to stay up? Or? <laughs> you want to judge? You can judge. Um, all right. We're throwing this back. Finalists. So look, we ran way over, but I didn't want to cut off um, the abyss of death. Uh, all right. So one, two, three, four. You're gonna write your vote down, but don't do it just yet. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> um, so here's what we're gonna do. Uh, yeah, we need penage. So you each get to ask one question. Keep it short. Keep it short because time is of the essence. Um, I'll let the judges decide. Who would you like to go first, a friendly learning or Seaport? What? A friendly. A little slicker, bald. <laughs> I feel the camaraderie, right. the love. Nice.
So come on forward. Uh, why don't we start with Rebecca? It's a little late. For one question. Quick answer. Test my acquisition plan. All right. So we build cost-effective and profitable online programs for university departments. Um, and we're also good at maintaining good margins as we sell those products and services. So um, our experience in online education is going into departments and building insanely profitable programs. We've found already, by going into ASU and selling one department and showing how profitable it can be, that other departments are now reaching out to us. And so it is direct sales, to your point earlier, it is somewhat direct sales. But we feel that when we can show how profitable these can be and how easy it is, that the rest will follow like lemmings. Well, that was pretty good, a little long, but good. Uh, Jed, did was that a hand? Uh, just to follow up, I'm not sure that really answered the question. It sounds like your sales strategy is all local, you know, all ASU. How are you going to go after all the other universities and well, international as well? Absolutely. So, like I said, there is a direct sales component involved with it, absolutely. We do need to go reach out to department chairs and deans of colleges and introduce them to our product. And so in that regard, we need to have some direct sales. But as we grow the company and we start offering classes between universities, we see a huge amount of growth in students also coming onto the platform because they want to take classes from the best professors at other universities and other schools. Other questions? I have time. You want me to go? Yeah, sure. Um, what is your differentiation? I, again, I've seen a million companies doing this exact same thing, exact same UI, exact same value prop for the, the universities. Why you? Well, our research shows that 30% of universities are looking for a new learning management system. And we find that that's because that when you embark on creating a new learning program, even if you choose one of these other competitors, you still need other specialized resources and content creation tools. We're really good at making profitable learning programs, and so we're turning that workflow into technology so that we then have this. But you don't have like a core app you can tell us. You don't have a core feature. You don't have like a. I can, absolutely. Other than so, me being a university using the product, there's no way to. No, so some of the things we do, we have free offering tools to let you create this content, and we also help you automate and manage some of the tedious admin tasks that are associated with online learning so that the teacher can spend less time doing admin tasks and more time teaching. Those are sort of two questions. Uh, Jason, do you want to follow up? Or um, yeah, George? Yeah, sure. Uh, George? Do you, have, do you even have a question? Sarah okay. asked my question. You know, the one, one question I've got is, um, in some of the other companies we've talk, talked to, they've basically surfaced the concern that alumni relations groups inside the universities really get irritated about this because they say, well, you know, if we don't have physical contact with the students or if we have people that aren't on campus, it's going to basically reduce alumni giving. Do you have any input on, on how you can negate that concern? That's good. Mm -hmm. Very interesting question, for sure. Um, I, I think with any online learning program, you're still going to have a need for traditional brick and mortar classes. So it's not like we're looking to turn every university into a cloud system. So I, I don't think that we're looking to necessarily eliminate alumni relationships. And I don't necessarily see that, while I do see the point that without a campus, you do lose some of that sense of community, I don't see why we couldn't establish that same sense of community online. In fact, we see that with a lot of sites today. Keep it short. What uh, one thing in your personal, not the company's experience, in your personal experience qualifies you to do this better than anybody? I've built online, well, let me step back a second. I've seen the online learning market from all sorts of different angles. I started as a student, I TA'd, I've been a producer of online classes and built the template that's actually in use at Arizona State currently. It was used at the UCLA Film and Media Studies Department there, and it was used at, Arizona, or at University of Arizona as well. So I built several online learning programs at these departments as well, and I've seen it from the producer side, the technology, and now I'm here as a CEO. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Brendan Learning. Woo! Now, the man, the myth, the legend, the, the man who made Carmen San Diego. It's always a shame. Don't be. It's amazing. Can you get, how low can you get the price point? Uh, we're working with the, the company that can't be named. To, they're trying the same thing you said. They're trying to get it under 150 and towards the 100, but that's going to probably take a while. You, you think you can't, like yes. odds? Yes, 80% uh, uh, odds. We'll get people. In the, next, in the first year? First year. Okay. What uh, one thing in your personal experience qualifies you to build this product more than anybody else on the planet? <laughs> um, Did the record break somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see how the answer I, 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 I've spent you know, 25 years in the software industry of trying to make new devices and new software 
uh, available and, and approachable by the mass market. And I think that's one of the things of being in, in this industry is we always overlook kind of what the, what the average uh, consumer does. And I, I think, so I think that is what I look forward to, is making this really work for the people that are really going to use it. We don't have to go in order, but number three. <laughs> number three, that's what you call me now, number three. <laughs> number three. Uh, is there any way in which the deal that you've done with the company that runs with Kodak uh, be considered a uh, poison pill? Is there, any, is there anything in that deal that would limit your upside? Uh, no, we've been very careful of that, having good, um, through the Founders Institute, a lot of good advisors. So we're being very careful to have a very specific license with them because we want to license other hardware manufacturers also. And they are only doing a, they're doing a partnership kind of limited investment of us on the manufacturing side. And that's why we're keeping ourselves separate from But that's a very good point. We're being, trying to be very careful of that. The revenue streams aside from the, uh, the hardware sales. The uh, first okay. two years are about 70, 60, 70% 70 hardware sales when we get the platform established. And from then on, it's all subscription based. So that's, it's all, it's a subscription based service is what we're doing for added service for video sharing. And, mm -hmm. you know. Have you priced that one yet? Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're working with the same Kodak, the, the same company. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're confused to say right I, I, I forgot the, <laughs> forgot the lead into that. Um, we're trying to keep it, so it's a freemium based product. So we want to make sure that it's free to begin with because that's establishing it as the product. Uh, the, the services after that started about five bucks a month and they stay down. I mean, that's the whole point of it, to make it accessible. George? So, you know, the only commonality between Apple and Kodak is that they have five letters in their name. Um, I was co founder and lead co investor of Shutterfly, and I can tell you that Kodak systematically destroyed our major competitor, Ophoto. And the one thing I can tell you is find a better partner. Um, Kodak is one of the world's worst run companies, staffed by incompetence. Now let me tell you the bad parts. Uh, I thought this was a question. Yeah, it, it, is, it is a question. You know, what, what's the strategy for picking partners? Because that will send a huge signal to the market. You mean for picking? For uh, hardware partners. Well, it's, again, uh, it just happened that their market, now they have a, I agree with you, we have in fact an advisor who has started a, a digital uh, frame company that was sold to Kodak and had the same comments. Um, so our strategy was to find their uh, market segment just matched exactly ours. It's, it's the women market and they know how to do, they know the marketing side, but it has absolutely been a little bit of a challenge to work on the corporate side. So we're, we're starting with them and now with that we're actually branching out. We're working with uh, lots of, uh, of, of possible partners, everybody from Cisco and other people to try and, and make sure that we're in this market. That's exciting. Thanks. There's no exclusivity. No, it's, 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 yeah, th thanks for elaborating that there's multiple hardware partners. That's exactly. All righty. Well, that's enough to do. Who needs a pen? Hi. You got a big black pen to write something lovely with. Um, sorry. Um, does someone have another pen? Maybe Lauren? Right. Oh, or better, Apprendi. <laughs> this is an Apprendi pen. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. It only writes Apprendi. <laughs> Invisible for anything that doesn't start with A. <laughs> like ass. Um, <laughs> saying A, you know. First word that came to mind. Did you all have to write my name on it or not? <coughs> Boy. Did I read him? Yeah. Please. Uh, Seaport. I don't know who that was. <laughs> Seaport, yay! I don't know who that was. Apprendi! Oh, Seaport and Seaport! Woo! but yet begin because we're all, including hopefully Elon for a little bit, gonna be over.
Tell, oh, what did you win? Let's talk about that. That's right. Well, first, I'd like I'd like just to throw one thank out to the whole Founder Institute and funded and showcase team from Cindy, John, Nima, Lucy, Cassie. Where are you, Cassie? Thank Best one yet, this really rocked. The intern's downstairs, so what you win is the following. Uh, we just give you 2,500 bucks. You might have to nag me a little bit for it, but we send it along. Um, we pay pallet, Elon, so <laughs> big C, big C. Um, you also win. Uh, you get to pitch all four Karatsu Forum chapters uh, for free. <laughs> Which, uh, he uh, automatically gets sent to the Open Angel Forum as well, and you wouldn't have to pay for that anyway, but I am accepting both people, one and two, both. Of them. So, Additionally, you both get to come to the launch conference in February. Afraid. And you can bring your entire teams, like four people, five people. That's my guess. Maybe Elon will take you on a tour of his beautiful fat space factory. E, will you take the winner on the tour of a space factory? Will you take the tour? Will you give them a tour of the space factory in LA? All right. It's a very cool tour, actually. Is it not the coolest thing you've ever seen? Uh, Aaron, are you here? Aaron just went on it. That was sweet. Um, in addition, you get legal services from Cooley, and, uh, who is doing uh, amazing things for the community. As you see up there, you get uh, also coupons from Odesk. Now, I believe, where is uh, Media Temple? Are you around? Oh, so where are the bars, the infamous chocolate bars? Ah, uh, so you get really type initiative, um, and this is a free year on our new service called BE. Uh, it stands for Virtual Environment. We built, we put it out actually over the course of a year. Um, hopefully, you can use it, and if you can't, one, you're gonna make a really good best friend. <laughs> so, scale up your video quick because it's free. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to thank Microsoft. Jacob, are you here? Yeah. All right, Microsoft, thank you for hosting. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you to the judges. Thank you to the audience. And let's go thank the liquor in the next room.